Um, personal property. Um, another picture of Twilla. Um, the other tree. <laughs> the other tree. That, that, so we're, so there, those are, you, now you know that there, we have two trees in Twilla County. Um, what is personal property? Um, my personal property is a very empty wallet and uh, so and a very modest clothing. But basically, personal property is everything but real estate, improvements to real estate, intangible property, stocks, bonds, goodwill. Um, so basically, personal property comes a catch-all for everything but real estate, for the most part. I'm going to give you some examples of property. Um, Questar stock, is that personal property? No. How about a manufactured home? It can be. It, it can be and it may not be. A uh, rubber tree. Is that personal property? Inventory is not inventory for selling, correct? Inventory for resale, yes. Inventory for resale, is that personal property? No. Uh, it's actually personal property, it's exempt personal property. Um, rubber tree. How about a rubber tree? A rubber tree could actually be personal property that would be taxable in Utah um, because it could be a decoration. You have a rubber tree, you know, in, in an office um, as part of the decorations that could in fact be a, a taxable personal property. Um, if you, were grow if you had rubber trees and you had a plantation of rubber trees, which would not grow in Utah, but if you did, they would be exempt. How about a split level three bedroom? No. A cell tower. That is personal property. Yep, sure is. Essentially assess, essentially assess, we'll pick it up. We'll pick it up. As good as considered personal property. They you know. That's right. That's right. That was that was kind of a trick trick one there. A pickup truck. Actually, it is personal property, but it's just how it's assessed. Um, you know, uh, backhoe. It's personal property. Farmland. No, of course not. It can it be privilege tax can be real. Yeah, yep. So anyway, um, ATM machine. That's personal property. Um, you know, drill rig. Personal property. Our centrally assessed folks are not going to pick up a drill rig generally, but what they are going to do is they're going to communicate with you at the county that a drill rig is operating in your county. When the drill rig comes into your county, they need to come to the county and let, them, let you know you're there. Sure. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm sure they all do on a regular basis. But that's why they centrally assess folks when they see them. Basically, their basic guidelines uh, is the statute or tax commission rule define it. Um, is it readily movable? Um, is it movable as part of its function? You know, um, what is its highest and best use? What is it being used for? We, we talked about this in, in the Uinta Basin, a good example um, of something that could be personal property or real property. Ever seen these uh, great big uh, containers that are, that are you know, shipping containers? Well, you can attach those to real property. You can actually live in those. I wouldn't myself, but you know, you, the people put those together. Those could be real property, but they're generally um, personal property. 
So it's all part of its function. Um, <coughs> does the property serve the structure or does it serve the, uh, the production process? Um, a walk-in cooler, for example, looks an awful lot like real property. It's kind of attached in, to the walls. How is, you know, there's walls to it, but its purpose is, in fact, to cool as part of a production process. Um, and again, what is its highest and best use? Is its highest and best use as a structure to provide shelter? Or is it, you know, you could, I'll give you an example. What my, when my ancestors came to Tooele, Utah, back in the 1860s, they arrived with a wagon. That was all they had, and that's what they, that became their structure, their living structure for their first winter in Tooele, is they, they built a, a little canopy around the wagon. Did that, that wagon serve as real property, but its real function was personal property, its highest and best use as personal property. Now, a lot of personal property is, in fact, exempt. We talked about farm equipment and machinery. Now, Josh got in a little bit of trouble out in the Uinta Basin when he talked about a privileged class in Utah, um, which is farmers. Um, a lot I of love farmers. I do. Yeah, Josh loves farmers. He's, he's, now, he's now come around. Can anybody tell you otherwise? Yeah. Um, agriculture gets a lot, of, a lot of property tax privileges in this state, you know, in terms of the Farmland Assessment Act. And there is an exemption for farm equipment and machinery. The purpose behind this is to maintain a healthy agriculture industry in this state. Um, you know, a lot of times on marginal land. Um, so farm equipment and machinery is exempt from property tax. Production equipment is not. Um, so where you draw that line is sometimes not all that clear. I'm going to give you an example. Um, Walk-in cooler at a, uh, at a uh, uh, flower place, a greenhouse. Is that personal property taxable or exempt? It's, you've got a greenhouse and you got that, that has stores flowers. It's got flowers. It's for growing flowers. Well, it was initially taxed as taxable. It was ruled to be exempt. What they were using that for was to provide a cold treatment to, to seeds and bulbs in order to uh, stimulate germination later. It was part of the production process of agriculture. So it was actually exempt personal property. Um, household furnishings, that, uh, that grand piano you have in your house, that baby grand, is that taxable? How about if you uh, have piano lessons? Do you give up piano lessons? Technically, it can be. Um, inventory held for resale is exempt. Water infrastructure equipment, pumping, irrigation, electrical. Uh, Ruth already mentioned that. That's exempt. Personal property, because of its mobile nature, is a, is a challenge to discover. Um, because it's moving all the time. And uh, we've had situations where assessors have, been, have gone out and, and taken pictures of property in place as of January 1st, if they had any concern about whether or not someone was going to report that. Um, because of its portability, uh, property, you know, it's not recorded with the county or quarter's office. And sometimes determining ownership is a challenge. You see a backhoe in the middle of a field do you know who owns it? Backhoe isn't required to be titled. Backhoe is not required um, to ha be recorded with the recorder's office. So who owns that backhoe? That sometimes is, is uh, something you need to find out. So uh, determining ownership uh, is always an issue. Documentation of where the property was on January 1st is not always available. And so it's an imperfect process. And so you have to make certain assumptions. Now, what we require is we require um, businesses that operate in the state to have a signed statement go out to them. And the county assessor may request a signed statement from any person setting forth all the real and personal property accessible by the assessor, which is owned, possessed, managed, or under the control of the person at 12 noon on January 1st. 
and uh, there are a whole bunch of you know, you know, statutes under that. Um, you know, on or before May 15th of the year, the statement described is requested by the county assessor if the resolution of the county legislative body by the county adopts a deadline described in subsection 2A. So there's deadlines associated with it. Um, basically, it's, they have, once they receive that signed statement in the mail, they have 60 days to file it with the county. Or they have to file it by May 15th. Um, now, it can be sent when you become aware of the business. You're not always aware of the business on January 1st. And, uh, and so the minute you become aware of them, that mentioned before that construction company moves in to work on that pipeline, you become aware they moved into the county, you send them the signed statement. But it's generally sent early in the year, 60 days or May 15th, if the legislative body of the county adopts a resolution to that effect. Failure to send in an affidavit means the assessor gets to make an estimate. And generally the assessor is going to make an estimate that's on the high side, but they cannot make it, um, how should we say, just ridiculous. I mean, w w we have seen, you know, a small construction company get an estimate of, you know, $10 million, and unless you appeal it, you know, we're, you're, you're stuck with that. So you do have to be reasonable on your estimate, but uh, it wants to be high enough to to uh, make sure that they file with you, but it has to be within a certain level of reason as well. Um, refusal of the taxpayer to file the signed statement. Um, each person who fails to file the signed statement um, shall pay a penalty equal to 10% of the estimated tax due, but not less than $25 for each failure to file. So there are penalties associated with it, and the penalty may not be waived or reduced by the assessor, county, county board of equalization, or commission, except for a procedure for the review and approval of reductions and waivers adopted by county ordinance. So if you're going to reduce those, you need to make sure you have an ordinance in place, um, tax commission, or follow a tax commission administrative rule. I heard that yawn, by the way. It must be a long day. Anyway, any owner who neglects to refuse to file a signed statement um, requested by assessor, make a record of the failure to file and make an estimate of value of the property of the owner based on known <coughs> facts and circumstances. Again, known facts and circumstances. Okay. Now we talked about before about approaches to value. Most personal property uses a cost approach. Um, Basically what you're gonna do with, with personal property is you're gonna take an acquisition cost and you're going to depreciate it over its ec estimated economic life. And we approve evaluation schedules at the Tax Commission under Administrative Rule 8824-24P33. Like I said, most use of acquisition costs, less depreciation. Personal property is broken down into various class types where similar properties are given a similar economic life with a similar depreciation schedule. And Property Tax Division prints copies annually for use in affidavits. I left that one in there because that's what we used to use is the word affidavit. Um, but uh, we call them signed statements now. I, I'm still a product of the 90s when we used the word affidavit. So. Now, examples of classes of personal property, we saw that earlier under resources, you know, short life property, computer integrated machinery, short life trade fixtures, medical and dental equipment. Um, all of these have different economic lives and different depreciation schedules. And, uh, and one thing there has been over time is there's been a, an increase in the number of schedules. And the reason for this is that uh, when a new company moves into the state um, and they have a unique, a unique type of property, what they oftentimes want to do is they come to the tax commission and say, our property is really unique and guess what? It depreciates very quickly over a short amount of time. And so they usually want to push for their own schedule that has a fast depreciation rate over a short economic life. So you can see there's lots of, lots of schedules. Some of these are not um, based upon value. Um, some of these, for example, are on age-based fees. Um, 
class 11 street motorcycle um, class 17 vessels over 31 feet in length we have uh, boats are assessed based upon their length and age we have two criteria there let's see Now exempt property, we talked about that a little bit before, merchandise inventory, inventory held for resale. That is exempt. Aggregate and fair market value less than 10,200. This was a new provision that's only a few years old where um, property, if a small business has relatively little property, they've now exempt um, up to this certain limited amount of money. We thought that uh, there were some in our office thought that this might be a material reduction in personal property value um, for some entities. I have not seen any evidence to confirm that. Um, it takes a lot of businesses with $10,000 worth of personal property to what I call move the needle on the tax rate process. But uh, nevertheless, there's a lot of small businesses that became exempt from personal property because of that provision. An item of personal property with an acquisition cost less than $1,000 valued at less than 50% good. Farm equipment and scenery. We don't assess livestock. Some states, in fact, do assess livestock. But as I mentioned before, agricultural industry is, is uh, um, very much protected in, in our tax code. Property used for irrigation purposes. And of course, household furnishings. Now what does the acquisition cost include in that schedule? Um, it includes everything that it takes to put that item of personal property into service, which would include the freight, shipping costs, loading, unloading, any kind of installation, engineering, rigging, all sorts of assembly, you know, you have foundations that you put in, pilings, utility connections, and any other cost. Sales tax and use taxes are not considered in that. and. Uh, Sales and use taxes as well are included in there and any other cost. So acquisition cost. Includes the sales tax, yes. Okay. Yeah. So it does include uh, sales tax, which so we tax a tax, I guess. But it's just part, considered part of the cost of putting it in service. So what acquisition cost doesn't include is any kind of debugging you have to do licensing fees, permits, any insurance or security or those sorts of things. Let's talk transitory property a little bit. Um, transitory property, as mentioned before, is, is a material imp has a material impact on tax rates. But transitory property is a big source of revenue um, for a particular entity. Um, if you have big construction projects that come in, for example, road projects, pipelines, etc. cetera. Um, personal property standard 5.3, certainly property standard of practice 5.3 deals with situs and transitory issues, you know. And I encourage you to become familiar with that. If it is in the state of Utah as of January 1st, we assess it at 100% of its fair market value. Now, if it's brought in after January 1st and is in the state for at least 90 consecutive days, it receives a proportional assessment, but not less than 25%. So if you have a company that is in Utah and it moves its equipment from one county to the other, how does that work? That's intrastate. Okay. It's first come, first serve. Whoever assesses it first gets the whole value. Not to make you guys fight or no, we, now. Yep, and that's why it's really important to distinguish between intrastate transitory property and interstate transitory property because those rules are slightly different. Um, so if it's brought into the state after January first, um, it's slightly. Well, see, if brought in after January first, is in the in the state for 90 consecutive days, it receives the proportional assessment. But if it's in the state as of January 1st, it's assessed at 100% of its value, and it's whoever assesses it first. Dave? Yeah, Pat? Your, your term, whoever assesses it first. Uh, Casey. 
I would, that's a battle between you and Salt Lake County. <laughs> you, you might have an argument over the first year where it was, or many years, yeah. if you got out, I'd, yeah. I you know, and, and and that's certainly an option. You know, if you if you're if you're aware that they're in your county and they claim they pay to another county, you can you can demand them pay you and get get a refund from Salt Lake County. I mean, and, and now we at the state we don't try not to get involved in what we call situs wars, and believe me, they're real. Um, you know, we had an uh, assessor in Kane County who would go down into the, uh, to the Wahweep area and take pictures of boats on January 1st, you know, to catalog what boats were there, you know, people who were claiming their boat was in Salt Lake County. And uh, when I was at the DMV, we're, you know, we're trying to like, you know, we're, we're not in the business of, of negotiating who gets this money, you know, this, um, there are, in fact, situs wars that have taken place historically within the state of Utah over property and who assesses it first and who gets, who gets it. But just like how you guys, we want you guys all to work together as county officials in your office and things work better, the state as a whole works better when you don't step on each other's toes yep. and work with each other and every county is working with one another. So just make sure you're not stepping on any toes. Because, you, you, you know, Salt Lake County should be reasonable and say, hey, you know, this is, we understand that this was in your county. Um, I can't guarantee that, that, but I would think that Salt Lake County would want to have a good working relationship with, uh, with Millard County. And usually property is more material to a county the size of Millard than it would be in, in Salt Lake. All right, that, so that's the deal with interest state. Um, first to assess gets the entire value for the year, and the proportional assessment does not occur with interest state transitory property. Um, billing and collecting personal property. Um, the first billing, of course, is not the affidavit, but the signed statement. Um, and that serves as a notice. It should be sent as close to January 1st as possible. Generally, a check will be received with signed statement. Uh, tax becomes delinquent 60 days after the affidavit, but not later than May 15th. Interest begins accruing at that date. and. Uh, and you use the tax notice from the previous year. And uh, certified notice of an estimate of value. Uh, so you send that out by certified mail when you send out an estimate. Collection op options. Um, key statute here is 59-2-1302-1303. Attachment to real property. Attachment to real property, um, anyone know what that is? Pat. Yeah. Well, if you've got a uh, company that's, we got some companies that want their personal property attached. And if, you do it that way. And if you've got a company that has personal property that has a big, it might be used that as a tool and attach it to their real property statement. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and then it uh, becomes part of their tax. That's right. One of the things we want to stress is that it is a collection procedure for the county. It is not a payment option for the taxpayer. What if the taxpayer every year he says, I want it attached? I guess go ahead and do it. Most, most counties just charge the interest for it. You know, it's, they, fig they, they figure it's a, it's a better interest rate than they could get out in the market, you know. But what it does is it does secure that tax liability because one thing about the personal property, the personal property can disappear and leave the state. The land and improvements are still going to be there. And so that liability is more secure 
with real property than it is personal property. And that's why that attachment provision is in place. So if they don't pay, you can attach that to the real property of the owner. So you list the property with the real property. You can also seize the property and you can sell the property at public auction. There's uh, special requirements for manufactured homes. Anyone want to tell me what those are? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, because they are a residence, they go through some of the same uh, procedures that you have to with uh, with a home. There's a certain time period. Um, but yeah, you're generally right. You don't want to become the owner of mobile homes, manufactured homes, unless absolutely necessary. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, there are some special requirements there. Seizure and sale of uh, personal property. You have to sell a sufficient amount of property to cover the taxes. And you have to give one week's notice in the paper, and it must be a paper in general circulation in the county, and it has to post in three public places in the county. Um, manufactured homes, it's the same, but one year later. That's the special provision. You can do it, but you just have to wait a year. And by that time, I'm sure it'll increase in value dramatically. <laughs> Personal property audits. Um, basically, is an, God, I told Ruth Ann I'd take all the affidavit language out, but she's going to get on my case because I left. I, I, I missed a few, but uh, no stick in the mud. She got on my case because I still use the '90s terminology because I'm still stuck in the '90s. Even my attire is probably stuck in the '90s from all mm -hmm. I can tell. But but it basically, a personal property audit is an audit against the signed statement that is filed by the taxpayer. So basically what an auditor is going to do is they're going to look at the documentation behind the filing of income tax uh, statements, um, depreciation and expense info, receipts, freight and installation documents. They're going to take a site inspection. And you know it's surprising, but sometimes you don't have financial information behind assets that end up in the possession of a, of a business. Sometimes a brother-in-law, Leroy, just gives you that backhoe to, to use in your construction business. You know, and sometimes they don't have no idea how much was paid for that backhoe and they have to make an estimate of value. Um, those are the kind of things personal property auditors have to deal with. Sometimes you might have a restaurant that's changed hands four times and uh, the original purchase price of some assets, you have no idea what they're you know, what they, they were. So, you know, you kind of have to make uh, some judgment calls. And, uh, but basically it's an audit against that process. Um, there is due process associated with the personal property audits. Uh, the taxpayer is given 21 days to respond once they get a copy of the original audit. And if there is no response, a final audit is sent to the county for billing. Now, once the county bills, the taxpayer has 30 days to appeal. So they do have appeal rights. They can appeal to the county. And the county if you, as a county commissioner, you may get appeals before you um, through your Board of Equalization. I can rem still remember uh, defending personal property audits before our current governor when he was a county commissioner down in, uh, in Utah County. I didn't fare very well. You know. So he lost my vote, but nevertheless. And uh, now, personal property staff. This is a. Here's one of the legends of property tax right here. His name Herb Jenkins. He's the audit manager for uh, personal property. Um, and uh, yeah, he's been with the state longer than I have. When I first met him, he had a ponytail, and uh, and he, he's a little bit of a character. But he knows more about personal property than just about anybody I know. And uh, his, his uh, lead auditor, Gina Holder, and uh, she's very sharp. And her staff, last hiring decision I made as manager of personal property was I hired B2. James Teton's been there a long time, Cindy Dennis, Jen Tingey. And Laurie Gallegos, that's Herb's boss. And that's it. You guys have been real troopers. I've, we covered a lot of material. Is there any questions I can answer on personal property? <laughs>